Hey there, Global Crew. It's Richmond uh, checking in with you guys in our, I don't even know. I don't even know how long we've been in quarantine. It just it's, feels like forever. Um, but anyway, third lesson, third PowerPoint. That's exciting. We're going to continue on with these new ideas of the Renaissance. Um, so we've been looking a lot at Renaissance art um, and some of the, the places that Renaissance art was, was really important, like Florence. Uh, but the Renaissance is more than just pretty art. Um, it's also, and, and honestly, more importantly, it's about new ideas. And it's these ideas that are going to drive Europe forward and, also, and, and ultimately um, bring all of these different countries into something that's much more modern and much, much more familiar to the, you know, the, the present day. Um, before we do that, just a reminder, um, you guys are always welcome to reach out if ever you have questions. Um, so my office hours thus far have been on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 1 to 3. You guys are always welcome to join me during that time. Um, I've usually been holding Zoom hours, but if you need to shoot me an email, um, if you need to make a phone call, anything like that, I am, I am easily available to all of you. Please ask for help because that's what I'm here for. Um, so again, today we're going to be looking at new ideas of the Renaissance. There's going to be a, a a couple of pretty important concepts that we'll, we'll deal with. Um, and the first is going to be this idea of humanism. So we're going to talk about a lot of new ideas during the Renaissance, but easily the most important is this idea of humanism, because it kind of sums up all these other things. So what is humanism and how has it impacted how we think in the modern world? Um, and then secondly, we're actually going to talk about a pretty important new invention. In fact, some historians would argue it's the most important invention ever. Uh, I kind of kind of disagree, but um, anyway, it's this thing called the printing press, and we're going to see how it impacts life in Europe. Um, so let's hop right in and talk about this crazy new idea called humanism. So the Renaissance was way more than just about art. Again, it's easy to think, you know, it's Da Vinci and it's Michelangelo and it's Raphael and it's all these other important um, artists. That's what make up the Renaissance. That's just part of it. Because ultimately what the, the Renaissance is really more important for are these new ways of thinking, these new ways of seeing the world, of understanding what's going on. Um, that's what the Renaissance is all about. So when we talk about this idea of humanism, humanism is a return to Greek and Roman ideas. And you do that by concentrating less on medieval religion and more on just ordinary everyday life. So uh, you think back to what we saw during the Middle Ages, this big, long thousand year period of just rampant superstition and, and religious devotion and ultimate power in the Catholic Church. Um, humanism is, is kind of one of the first reactions to really push back against that and say, no, we're going to take things in a new direction. So there's less of this focus of God in heaven and more about people on earth. And that's really something that came out of this, this bubonic plague where, you know, millions of people around Europe are dying. People are praying like crazy, trying to solve this and it's not doing anything. And so people really begin to like step back and say, okay, maybe I need to live for the now. I mean, yes, I'm going to go to heaven someday and that'll all be great, but, but let's live right now because we don't know when we're going to die and we don't really know what to expect. Um, and so this is something that we see develop within humanism, um, and it's something that's really going to drive the idea forward. So, uh, you know, I mentioned Greek and Roman ideas. You think about all the science and the culture, all the learning, the education, all this kind of stuff that the Greeks and Romans had. This is a call back to that. We're going to use the Greeks and Romans as really good, strong examples of what kind of people we want to be, um, instead of always looking at the Bible. I mean, again, you think of the, the Catholic Church during the Middle Ages, and if, if ever there was a question to something, well, what does the Bible say? What does God say about it? Um, so, so now if we can look at the Greeks and the Romans, we're going to have new ideas. We're going to have new ways to approach this thing that we call life. Um, so what we really see kind of blossom out of this is this concern for real life situations in a very secular sense. Now, you may have heard this word secular before. I'm sure I've used it before, uh, but secular just means non-religious. So it's anything that, you know, apart from religion. I mean, in the United States, we have a secular government. We have a government that's not governed by the Bible. It's governed by, you know, the Constitution. That's not a religious document. It's a, it's a political one. 
on. Um, you guys go to a secular high school. You know, you're not tied to any particular religion. It's not like we have prayer time or anything like that. It's secular. It's non-religious. That doesn't mean that it's anti-religion. And certainly as, as people are pushing through the Renaissance and becoming more humanistic, it doesn't mean that they're becoming atheists. They're not. They're just saying, you know what, maybe we need to dial that whole religion thing back a little bit and just concentrate on the here and now. Let's do stuff for us instead of always for God. Now, before we abandon this idea of humanism, I just kind of want to like simplify it a little bit because I know I just threw a lot of stuff out at you. Um, but humanism is really all about three major ideas. So if you had to boil humanism down to three big points, it would be these. Number one, humans are pretty darn incredible. Like we've done some really amazing things throughout history purely because we wanted to, because we could. It's not like all the only great things of, of humanity happened either for a God or because of a God. We can do some cool things on our own. Um, and that's a, an important piece of this whole puzzle. The second piece is that maybe religion isn't really as important as people used to think. I mean, remember, again, in the Middle Ages, religion, religion dominated everything. The Catholic Church had supreme power, and now that we're pushing into this humanistic idea, people are, are they're, again, they're dialing it back. Let's not abandon religion, but let's just de-emphasize it a little bit. Um, and the third point is, you know, if you really need good examples to follow, look to Greece, look to Rome, look to these, you know, great mythological heroes or these historical figures. Um, look at these great works of poetry and art. You really want to be inspired. You really want to know in what direction you should go. Look at Greece and Rome. So this is sort of humanism in a nutshell. Again, humans are pretty stinking cool. Religion, mm, kind of meh. And then Greece and Rome, they're awesome too. Um, now, a few years ago, back when, you know, we used to have classes in a classroom, um, at this point, somebody raised their hand and they said, Mr. Richmond, this is kind of like you. And I went, what? And they said, well, no, you look at these three things. They, these are these are just like you. Um, and, and I kind of chuckled at it. And the more that I think about it, I'm like, yeah, I guess I'm kind of a, a humanist. Um, that first piece there, you know, humans are pretty amazing. It's literally my job to tell you about how amazing people have been throughout history. Second thing, I don't think it's any secret that I can be a little critical towards organized religion sometimes. Um, and then third piece there, like, hello, if you've ever spent five minutes with me, you know I'm mildly obsessed with Greece and definitely Rome. Um, so if you want to, you know, think humanism and all of a sudden have this ugly mug pop in your head, you do your thing. I mean, that works. I, I guess I can be a humanist today. I am kind of a humanist. Let's just go. We're good. You got this? We're moving on. Okay, um, so another super important uh, idea to come out of the Renaissance, um, and certainly something that, it's not like it was new, it just hadn't been seen in a thousand years, was this idea of individualism. So individualism is the idea of being an individual, being able to make your own decisions, to be able to decide what you want to do, how you want to think. And this is tied in with humanism, but it's also its own thing. Um, so, you know, individualism would not have been a, a, a thing that people think about in the Middle Ages. I mean, we are, our culture, the United States, we are saturated in this idea of individualism. I mean, our entire government is based on individualism. Who do you want to vote for? Um, our entire economy is based on individualism. What do you want to buy? What do you want to have in your house or your stomach or on your body or whatever? You know, individualism is all that we are in the United States. But in the Middle Ages, you know, people saw themselves very differently. You didn't really see your own wants, your own needs, your own desires. It's more of a, what we can call a collectivized culture. People saw themselves as part of a whole, not as a singular individual. So you know, might have like a peasant out in his field and he's not you know, going to throw the hoe down and be like, I don't want to farm turnips anymore. I want to be something. No, I mean, you just, you just sort of like fell into your role because that's what you did. You didn't really think about what you wanted, what your desires were. So now people can kind of begin to make decisions for themselves once they have this idea of individualism. They can decide, you know, what do you want? What do you want to buy? What do you want to do? What do you want to believe? What do you want to think? Um, and so this is a very secular idea because, of course, in a religious sense, individualism is kind of dangerous. I mean, this is where we get into sin. You know, if you're only worried about what you want, you're not worried about what the big guy upstairs wants. Um, and so individualism in a religious sense, can sometimes even be problematic. Um, but in, you know, in this new secular mindset that we're going for, um, 
it's okay and it's it's even encouraged and certainly it's something that we encourage a lot in in our culture today so pushing aside all these new ideas, let's get to a new invention and let's just see where we go from here. Um, in about 1450, there was a, a German guy by the name of Johannes Gutenberg, and he built this new invention that we call the printing press. Now, he was building it again in Germany. Back then, it was the Holy Roman Empire, which once more was not Holy Roman or an actual empire, but it's fun to pretend. Um, so he built it in Germany. But it's going to very, very quickly spread throughout Europe. Now, we have talked about printing presses in China before. Technically, the Chinese did have printing presses like hundreds of years before Gutenberg was alive. Um, but just, you know, it, the, the, the Chinese printing presses didn't really go outside of China too much, whereas Gutenberg's printing press is going to be it's going to have a much bigger impact globally. Um, it's also a little easier to use. So let's talk about what this is, because I feel like I'm rambling. Um, the printing press in this sense was a machine that allowed for much faster printing of documents. So before this point, books had to be copied by hand. Remember, um, uh, we, we mentioned in class how books would be pretty much penned by hand by monks. So you'd have an abbot up at the front of the room, he'd be reading and everybody's gotta be copying down everything that he's saying, it's miserable. It also takes a very, very, very long time when you're thinking about a book that's as long as say like, oh, I don't know, the Bible. Um, so when you have a printing press, you have all these little tiny letters and you can line them up in particular rows. You slap some ink on them, you stamp it onto a page, you open it up and look, you have a page that has all of the words. But now you can put some ink on it again, and there you go, you've got another one and then another one and then another one and it just keeps going. Um, so it means that you don't have to copy books by hand anymore. It means that you can have a much faster printing of documents and this is gonna be really, really key. Um, many historians see this as one of, if not the most important technological development in history. I got to give that important, most important idea to farming because we'd still be in caves without it. But maybe this is a close number two. Um, and it's because of how it's able to share information. If you can get a message to people quickly and at a large scale, Guys, that's game changing. I mean, that's that's huge. I mean, you think about how much information goes through the internet right now. Well, what about in a world without a printing, even a printing press? I mean, so much less information is able to spread. So once you have a device like this, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be enormous. Um, so why is it so important? Because remember, during the Middle Ages, very few people could read and write. It's not that they didn't want to. Um, part of, I mean, sometimes they didn't want to, but whatever. Um, part of this was just that books were so stinking expensive. It was really hard to get a, you know, 100, 200, 300, 400, 500 page book that people would have to copy by hand. So certainly your average peasant wouldn't have a book. Um, but even a lot of, you know, wealthy people couldn't get their hands on many books. So now once we have the printing press, you can make books a whole lot faster and making them faster means you can also make them a whole lot cheaper. If they're cheaper, that means they're easier to get a hold of and then this just becomes a whole big thing. Um, so more and more people are able to actually learn how to read. So we're going to start to see this new spread of ideas. Uh, an increase in literacy um, means a new spread of ideas. People can begin to share thoughts. They can begin to share experiences, beliefs, all this kind of stuff. So with all of these new ideas, um, this can get a little bit dangerous for those who are already in power because people can begin to question things. You know, before in the Middle Ages, well, you, I mean, you just do what you're told. But now, if you can actually read other people's ideas, you can begin to say, well, you know what, maybe there's a better way that we can make this government work. Or maybe that's not actually what our religion says. And now you're gonna open up Pandora's box and things are gonna go crazy if you start questioning the status quo. And this is certainly what we're gonna see within Europe. Now, before we wrap this up, I just want to talk about uh, a couple pretty important people when it comes to this whole, you know, literacy and literature idea. Um, and, uh, um, you know, we're going we're to talk just, again, very briefly about a couple of important authors during this time. 
um, because we've spent some time on the artists, but let's look at the authors because again, it's those ideas that are really going to reshape history. Um, so literature is going to become more and more important now that people can read. And the other piece to this is that authors begin writing stories in what we would call the vernacular language. Vernacular is just a term that means the local language as opposed to, in most cases, the language of the church. So remember, the church was doing all their services, all their writings in Latin, but nobody could read Latin unless you were part of the church, which was very, very few people. So most people had no idea, you know, even if they could read, they'd need to also know Latin just to understand what the book was all about. So a lot of these new authors that we're about to mention are going to write in the vernacular language. They're going to write in the language that everybody actually speaks. So if you're keeping track, you know, the vernacular language of the United States would be English, right? American English. Um, the vernacular of France is French. The vernacular of Italy is Italian. The vernacular, vernacular, vernacular um, of Germany is German. Um, so it's the local language. It's, it's what people speak normally. So let's look at three important authors of the Renaissance. We've got three important dudes here, all ridiculously important to some of the new things that are going on during this time. Um, the first is a guy by the name of Dante. Dante is from Florence originally. Um, well, he moved there for a while, he's back and forth. Anyway, Italy, he's an Italian guy. Um, he's, so he's a very famous Italian writer and poet. Um, he's so famous as a poet, actually, uh, that many people in Italy just refer to him as il poeta, um, which just means the poet. So if you talk about the poet in Italy, you're usually talking about Dante. Um, so Dante wrote a bunch of stuff. His most famous works are uh, the Divine Comedy, the Inferno. Um, and and what makes him so famous is he's he's sort of like you know he's playing with with language. He's playing with something that's accessible to people. Um, he toys a little bit with religion. Um, in fact, his book The Inferno is all about his make-believe trip to hell um, where he and, and a couple others sort of go down into the bowels of hell and they see all these famous people who have been damned to eternity. Um, it's a pretty dark and kind of miserable book, but it's an important first step in this new vernacular literature. Um, in fact, Dante's version of Italian, um, the the language um, dialect, you know, you think about different dialects like Southern uh, English versus British English versus the English that we speak up, you know, in New York State. Um, the, the version of Italian that Dante spoke kind of set the stage for how Italian would sound in the modern day. Um, so he's, he's very important in, in building this vernacular language. Um, the second guy is also from Italy. He's a Florentine. He comes from Florence. Um, and his name is Niccolo Machiavelli. Now, Machiavelli is one of the most important political writers in history. Um, I mean, he's, his works are still looked at 500 plus years later um, because they're very profound. Um, so he's Italian. He writes about government a lot, like I said, a lot of politics. Um, his most famous work by far is a book called The Prince. Um, and The Prince uh, was actually written for one of the, the Medici family, if you remember me mentioning the Medici um, in the, the first talk that we had on, on the Renaissance. Um, they're a very powerful family. And so he, he wrote this book particularly for one of them, a guy by the name of Lorenzo the Magnificent. Um, and pretty much what the whole book does is discuss how to be a good leader. Like, what does it mean to be a good leader? And he makes a couple comments in here that are, are still pretty controversial today, um, but they're very thought provoking. So one of the things that he argues is that every leader should be both loved and feared, but if you could only have one of those, it's better to be feared than loved. Um, and he makes his case and he, he pretty much says, you know, it's more important that the people fear you and respect you than they do love you because if they love you too much, they might treat you as a joke. Um, and so this is, you know, one of those things that various dictators throughout history have, have often said, you know, I'd rather be feared than loved. Um, and, and certainly a lot of people will draw inspiration from Machiavelli. The other thing that's very, very Machiavellian uh, is this idea of the end justifies the means. And we'll talk more about this when we talk about absolute leadership. 
in a few weeks. Um, but the end justifies the means is pretty much this idea of Machiavelli to, you know, whatever your goal is, as a leader, it shouldn't matter how you get to that goal as long as you do. So if you need to accomplish an objective and doing so means you need to burn down an orphanage, you do what you got to do. The end justifies the means. The goal is is explained by, uh, or, excuse me, explains um, how it is that you get there. So it can get pretty dark. And you can see how some people might abuse some of the ideas of Machiavelli. Uh, but he is going to be very important. And certainly a lot of very big, powerful people throughout history will love Machiavelli's works. Um, the last dude is not Italian. He's actually English. And I'm sure you've heard his name about a thousand times before. That would be William Shakespeare. Um, and so he was English. He wrote a lot of different stories and plays about everyday human stuff. I mean, he played with mythology and whatnot a couple times and, and important historical figures. Um, but for the most part, he's not writing religious plays. He's not writing... Um, you know, stuff that's that's too out there crazy. Um, he just wants to write about ordinary human stuff. Um, there's a million different things that he writes. His most famous is Romeo and Juliet, um, which is just ridiculous. I don't know if you guys had the opportunity to read through Romeo and Juliet with Durfee, but it is not a love story. It's an obsession story, and it's ridiculous. You've got like two 14-year-olds falling in love after one date and being willing to kill themselves for each other. Don't be like Romeo and Juliet. It's dumb. Anyway, um, he's also got a bunch of other stuff. Macbeth, Hamlet, Othello, Julius Caesar, my personal favorite, Titus Andronicus, which is a really weird story about ancient Romans. And there is a scene where someone um, puts another character's children into meat pies and force feeds them. It gets real dark. Anywho, um, these are some famous authors of the Renaissance, Dante, Niccolo Machiavelli, Will Shakespeare, all fantastic humanists, all great thinkers in their own way, uh, and all certainly helped by this idea of the printing press. So um, on that note, make sure you've got some stuff written down just to kind of help you out. Make sure you answer the questions that follow. Um, and if you need any help, please reach out to me. I hope you guys are doing well and staying healthy. Um, and I hope to see you soon. So we'll see you then. And uh, bye.